right, this is a quick overview of pars fractures and pars defects. The pars is this little portion of bone right behind the pedicle here, and it's a very thin plate of bone. It doesn't have a lot of marrow in it. The top and bottom are both very calcified surfaces, cortex of the bone. In the middle, it leaves very little room for bone marrow. And so when there is a fracture through this pars portion of the bone, it doesn't heal quickly. There's not a lot of marrow to form a natural fibrin scaffolding and to refill with the mesenchymal stem cells that rebuild that bone structure. We've shown in animal models that if you knock out bone marrow stem cells, the bone fracture does not heal well. And if you resupply those bone marrow uh, mesenchymal stem cells, the bone does heal quickly again. And so simply by the mere fact that number one, it's a thin plate of bone, and number two, there's not a lot of marrow in it, these types of fractures tend to be chronic and not heal, or they're non-union fractures, meaning that they have not unionized together. And that leads to substantial amounts of pain through the rest of a patient's life. And so there have been a variety of surgical approaches to treating these types of injuries. In the past, we used to put buck screws in, or um, little par screws, or laminar wiring but the vast majority of the time that would fail, not to mention the fact that it requires a heavily invasive surgery that can lead to more and more surgeries, especially if you end up having to do a fusion. The fusion will fuse the levels here and here, but above and below it will always have to compensate the mobility, and that leads to adjacent segment disease and further and further extensions of the fusion to the point where we were doing 12th redo spine surgery and it was just, chronic scar tissue, chronic pain, and a life of redo surgery. So if you can avoid that at all, that's the best strategy. So my new approach for treating pars fractures has been to use a minimally invasive image guided approach where it's essentially just little needles. Sometimes we use a endoscope to visualize the defect and really make sure we're patching it in well, but either way, it's minimally invasive, fast recovery where you can walk out of here with minimal to no pain and all I do is patch over the pars defect and into the pars defect. In some cases, when there's an actual fracture defect, I can fill that in with PRF scaffolding. It's a fibrin scaffolding that replicates the natural process of a bone healing. In addition, I fill it with mesenchymal stem cells that we harvest from the back of the pelvic bone in this nice little reservoir of stem cells that's easily accessible. There's no weight bearing or tendon or ligaments that really hold on to that portion of bone. So it's easily accessible by just numbing it up and drawing it out with a bone marrow needle. We take those mesenchymal stem cells and place them into the fracture defect, patch them with the PRF scaffolding, and if there is an actual defect, then I will patch inside and underneath and over the top and everything, which you can do for a variety of image-guided techniques. Interestingly, ultrasound has been relatively useful for visualizing these pars fractures, whereas fluoroscopy and x-ray are not as useful actually. I've even seen an MRI completely miss a pars fracture where the bone was swollen but you couldn't see the defect until we got a CT scan. So sometimes these go unnoticed on MRIs and CTs but they can cause a tremendous amount of pain so it's always worth looking for them. When I do the procedure, we do it under a conscious sedation. You don't, you don't even need to be fully sedated or under general anesthesia with your tube in your throat. So that's quite useful as well. And it also helps me because if I'm putting the needle there and it's replicating the pain that you have, that tells me 100% that is the generating source of your pain. I've mainly seen this in two different age groups. I've seen it in 50 to 60 year olds who are getting osteoporotic and degenerative disc where the disc slips forward and eventually fractures the vertebral bone here and it allows the disc to slide forward as a spondylolisthesis or anterolisthesis, leaving that fracture site open. But surprisingly, the other large group of patients that I've seen this in is young adolescents, especially females, but also males, where they are starting contact sports and their bodies are still developing and they're under high metabolic loads. And for whatever reason, they are highly prone to pars fractures, both because the bone is metabolically active, they're growing, they're in a high demand sport, and they're getting hit and injured more than ever, usually in sports like soccer, sometimes in gymnastics, and a variety of other contact sports. The, the young male that I saw, he was a basketball player who had gotten hit and knocked down. 
So we see this more and more it seems. And these pars fractures, again, the last thing you want to do as an adolescent is to be put into a fusion surgery and have to go down that repetitive surgery road the rest of your life. So I think this is a far better, far more minimally invasive and far more successful approach to treating pars defects and pars fractures. In some cases, these are not definitive fractures. They're uh, sort of an attempt to heal the fracture and they look more like a defect. So we call them pars defects. I have seen this both on MRI and especially on endoscope where I've brought an endoscope in either from above, like posteriorly or laterally. And it looks like the bone has attempted to heal, but it's sort of this degenerative bone that can't really bear the stress and strain and, and, and tension factors on it. And so it's sort of like a weird calcified, almost like a granulation scar tissue that is not useful at all for restoring the structure and integrity of the, of the spinal bones. So regardless of whether the bone is degenerative and has attempted to form a patch through the pars fracture, um, in that case we would call it a pars defect. Um, regardless of whether it's a defect or a true open fracture, the most successful therapy that I've seen so far has been with the PRF scaffolding across and inside and through and under the defect and through the fracture line. Uh, with bone marrow stem cells. So I think that's really encouraging information. Again, we're continuing this study and hope to have more and more data and more and more imaging to confirm all of this in the future. But I think all those results so far are really encouraging and really exciting. So thank you.